Many people speak today about the lost art of leader interpretation. Mm -hmm. Is it a lost art? Undoubtedly, there have been changes in interpretation. Mm -hmm. And is it legitimate to say that there was an older style which had certain common characteristics, which is dead? Or is it possible that people are only talking about their favorite artists who are no longer performing? No, I think when Fijaniska and I will no longer sing Lida, I think there will be there is then for the time being a, a different approach, which is a pity. But ours will be coming along again. The thing is that at the moment there are such a lot of young singers with marvelous voices, marvelous techniques, and uh, they apply the voice and the technique and the musicality, the phrasing, all this to Lida, and they apply also mostly a very good pronunciation, which is all fine. Now, for us, this was only the beginning. We wanted quite something different from Lida singing. We wanted, and it was really my husband who wanted that. Fischer Disco, one cannot compare with anybody really, you see, because he's a really fully made artist sprung out of uh, choice head, you know, this is something or Kongul. But what my husband and I wanted is not just singing lines and phrases and words and uh, pronunciation and the right tempo and uh, the right color, the right youthful color of that beautiful voice, right? No. We wanted really to convey the poetry by more than that, by by the appropriate color, I can't say it in any other words. When you have, let's say in Tokyo or otherwise in Japan, this sea of people underneath you and you now set out to make them smile, cry, laugh, or come out really wrung out, you can't do it by pronunciation and you cannot do it by beautiful phrasing, that's all fine, but they will not cry or smile or laugh or be made another person by this experience. And that's what one wants. There's always somebody in the audience or some several people who will be made different by that experience and will learn something about poetry and about all kinds of ways of life and which they never, never, ever, ever come across in the, nor did we. We have to set our imagination to work when we sing leader singing, we have the poem and the music, and we try and study it as carefully as we can and find out from the way it has been composed, why the composer uh, composed it just that way. And then we try and find the reason behind it and the emotional reason and the situation and the psychological reasons behind it and try and give it the color of that particular emotion. And uh, when I hear recitals now, well phrased, well sung, and they don't touch my heart, and they don't give me the truth of the emotion. For me, that is not quite enough. The young singers don't have the courage to do it, and they don't have anybody, perhaps with them, quite with the knowledge, with, I was so lucky to have my husband, you see, who made me do it, to, uh, to kindle this kind of imagination and really go all out and do it, whatever the voice might do. Sometimes you have to produce an ill-sounding voice. Uh, you have to have a very rich palette of colors, even in that one voice you have only got, but you still have to try and get so many colors as you possibly can, as you would have in life, as you would, if a great actor would recite a recital of poems of various periods, of various poets, he would use different voices. Olivier would use different voices. If he recites uh, Shakespeare or he recites Byron, he wouldn't do it with the same approach. And we have, in addition, the composer who has already given us the right approach to it. We only need to look what's written down there and to listen to the chording and to the way of the, the weaving and watch the tempi exactly. It's in, it's in there. It's in the music. What is it that you try to convey in seminars and workshops uh, about leader, primarily, in leader interpretation? Well, there are very many things uh, to, in the first place to make them look really at the music as it's written. Usually they are wrong tempi, wrong, they do not look where they were, the uh, 
dynamics really are, whether it starts at uh, sort of a uh, 16th before or after and why. The main thing is I make them try to find out why, what's the psychological reason behind the way a crescendo is done, why there's a crescendo or a decrescendo or a subito piano or not just do it, that's not enough. I just want them to feel the human reason behind the written down things. How did you learn what you learned about the art of leader singing? Well, I was very lucky, you see. The husband of, of Maria Evegrün was Michael Raucheisen, mm -hmm. one of our very greatest, well, the, the great German accompanist. And they made me sing leader right away from the beginning. And uh, so I have always sung leader with many, many people, many approaches, until, of course, along came my husband, and then came the real thing. That really was then the real kindling of what could be done. And what was his major contribution to your understanding of, uh, let's say, the art of interpretation well, in Lieder? Well, maybe uh, trying to awaken the, the imagination. It was. Kindling the imagination of what was in the poetry and in the music. I think that is the biggest contribution, and right from the beginning. And then, of course, criticizing, criticizing, controlling. Uh, yes and nay, and more nay than more no than yes, I can tell you. Also, of course, enriching my repertoire very much. He made me sing things which I thought I would have never been able to sing. It's much too short now to talk about it. One would have to show it on the hand of records, and I could put the finger on it, because it's there, there, there's Walter Lake, here's Walter Lake, here's Walter Lake. It's, when I well, hear my records now, you, yes. I can hear my husband talking, doing, standing, conjuring it out. He was a conjurer. I actually, he wanted to call uh, the memoirs of him about himself. One of the titles was Midwife to Music, and that was what he was. <laughs>